Good day, everyone. Welcome to our Youth AI Lab talk. We are very excited to have you all here. Uh, before introducing today's talk, I just would like to give a brief overview of the Youth AI Lab speaker series since we have quite a few new audience members here. For those who are new to Youth AI Lab and what we do, my name is Melinda. Uh, I am president of Youth AI Lab. We are we are a youth-led nonprofit US organization catered to increase students' extra connections, AI literacy, and making high school students future ready. This webinar is a part of our monthly speaker series to raise awareness of AI among all communities. We invite experts from academia and industry to share their knowledge and discovery in specific areas of AI. So unlike other technical talks, these talks will be tailored to people without much background in AI. So therefore, they're fun to listen to and easy to follow. We hope that by listening to these talks regularly, you can gain a solid knowledge of AI. So please help spread the word about Youth AI Lab Talks. Thank you for your support of this education and community service initiative. And of course, please also considering visiting our website at youthai.org and sign up to receive announcements for other upcoming events like this one and for resources. And for those who miss our talks, feel free to also watch the webinar recording, which will, will be released on our YouTube channel after the talk. We've hosted 26 fantastic talks since the kickoff of the Youth AI Lab speaker series. And we kicked off our inaugural Youth Speaker Series last March with OpenAI researcher Dr. Yang Song. So if you want to keep up to date with any upcoming talks or events, you can either follow us on social media, Eventbrite, or register on our website at youthai.org. Our speaker series covers important areas of AI, such as efficient AI, graphics AI, cognitive AI, finance AI, as well as different implications of AI. Our speakers are held in high regard in both in their respective fields, whether it be academia or industry. We have speakers from big players in industry, such as Meta, Microsoft, and speakers from top AI universities, such as Carnegie Mellon, MIT, UC Berkeley, and Stanford. Replays of these talks are mostly available on YouTube channel, with the exceptions of a couple talks which are not available on YouTube due to company policy. For our last Youth AI Lab talk and the very first Youth AI Lab talk of the year, we are honored to have Biao Wang. Biao Wang delved into the critical topic of fostering inclusivity and representation in the data behind AI tools. Biao shared invaluable insights on the challenges in this domain as a Google product manager and emphasized the importance of addressing them in the development of AI technologies. While unfortunately this particular talk, the replay is not available on YouTube due to company policy, you can watch replays of our other previous talks up on our YouTube channel. And for our upcoming talk, which is scheduled next month in February and uh, next month in March, Saturday, um, the 23rd at 5:30 p.m. PST, um, we will be featuring Google Product Manager Austin Maja. So more details along with the registration will be released sometime this week on our Eventbrite. So definitely be sure to subscribe to our social media channels like LinkedIn, Instagram, or Eventbrite, or join us on our website to keep posted. Before introducing Professor Jin Jun Xiong, I'd like to briefly go over the logistics of this fireside chat. Since we have an audience watching from our YouTube live stream as well as on Zoom, we will be doing Q&A through a platform called Slido. So you could either go to the URL that I'm about to paste in the chat, or you can go to Slido and enter the event code 12365. Um, and so I have sent the link to the chat for anyone who wants to ask questions. Um, we encourage you to submit any questions throughout the discussion and we'll be answering questions as a part of the talk at the very end. Um, so be sure to stick around for that. Now to introduce our guest today. Professor Jin Jung Xiong. Dr. Xiong is currently an Empire Innovation Professor with the Department of Computer Science and Engineering at the University of Buffalo. He also serves as the Scientific Director and Co-Director for the $20 million National AI Institute for Exceptional Education and Director for Sunny UB Institute for Artificial Intelligence and Data Science. Prior to that, he was a senior researcher and program director for AI and hybrid cloud systems at the IBM Thomas J. Watson Research Center. He was the former co-founder and co-director of the IBM Illinois Center for Cognitive Computing Systems Research, and the success of which in five years has led to a 10-year, $200 million expansion of the center to the IBM Illinois Discovery Accelerator Institute. 
His research interests are in across stack AI systems research, including AI applications, algorithms, tooling, and computer architectures. Many of his research results have been adopted in IBM's products and tools. He's published more than 160 peer-reviewed pe papers in top AI conferences and systems conferences. His publication won eight Best Paper Awards and nine nominations for Best Paper Awards. He also won top awards from various international competitions, including the Championship Award for the IEEE Graph Challenge on Accelerating Sparse Neural Networks in 2020, and the First Place Award for the 2019 DAC Systems Design Contest on Designing an Object Detection Neural Network for Edge FPGA and GPU devices, respectively. So now I'll hand the floor over to our brilliant guest today. Professor Xiong, inviting him to delve a bit deeper into his background and share with us more about his work in the field, including shedding light on these on efforts addressing vital speech service gaps in children's education. So let's give a warm welcome to Professor Xiong. Thank you for being here today. Thank you. Thank you, Melinda. And thank you so much for inviting me. And uh, this is a very, very exciting uh, event. And uh, Thank you for, for yourself and also the previous uh, key leaders and uh, to organize this event. And um, indeed, the AI is very important, but I think more, more important is educating our young generation, you guys, you know, to make sure that you guys are all well-versed in AI and uh, really make use of AI for the social good and uh, for the benefit of our society, which is kind of part of my topic today. And uh, thank you for inviting me. And also, I'm very honored to be part of this like, uh, Elliot uh, speakers. And I know you have a lot of very good speakers ahead of me. So, and I try to bring some little bit different perspective and uh, make sure that everyone can get something out of this uh, presentation. So I'm going to start to share my screen and uh, feel free to, uh, as uh, Melinda said, you know, just uh, uh, leave your questions and uh, Melinda will monitor the those uh, questions, right? If you have any questions, feel free to uh, either interrupt and um, or just, uh, Melinda, just, uh, I'll leave it to you, right? And I'm okay for either way, okay? Yeah, yeah. So we'll be doing Q&A at the very end. So uh, I'll be sure to monitor and we'll ask them uh, after you speak. Okay, great, great. Okay, so let me just get started here. And um, so, Good morning, good evening, and good afternoon, wherever you are. And uh, thank you for, for being here and uh, this Use AI uh, Forum. And uh, I'm going to give a talk on um, a topic, right? Called the, I, I, the title is called The Quest for Scaling uh, Earthly AI Holistically. And in particular, the subtitle is Advanced AI uh, that can help and how to um, advance AI to help children with the speech and language services need. And um, so let me just uh, quickly give you a little bit of uh, kind of a personal stories, you know, and I'm sure that I know probably most of you, right, and uh, joined this meeting, heard of the artificial intelligence, or we call the AI. And uh, so before I kind of delve into some of the uh, challenges or the interesting aspect of AI, I'd like to share with you some of my personal journey and uh, how that has shaped my view about artificial intelligence and also shaped my own research journeys and uh, towards AI. And uh, this journey actually started about uh, uh, now it's 14 years ago now, and uh, it's that 2010. And uh, probably most of you probably said too young, right? 2010, most of you, some of you probably still <laughs> was, wasn't born yet, I don't know, okay? And uh, or maybe you're still at, at that time, you're kind of maybe in, um, uh, just uh, born. And a lot of things happened in 2010. and. Um, so just want to uh, flash back a few things, you know, and in case you don't, you you, you didn't know, right? These are the few uh, key things happened, you know, at that time, and uh, that is all related to the big event. And uh, the first one is the Haiti earthquake, right? That's the beginning of the twenty. I'm sorry, okay, twenty ten. Okay, that's a typo here. It's twenty ten, and uh, that uh, destroyed uh, millions of homes and. Uh, and a thousand, ten, a uh, hundred thousand, and almost two hundred thousand people uh, actually uh, dead because of the earthquake. And uh, the second event is this BP oil uh, spills in the Gulf of Mexico, and uh, they around April uh, twenty ten. 
And uh, that is uh, well, one of the largest and uh, probably the most uh, uh, kind of detrimental disaster to the environment and uh, because of the oil spills into the ocean. And another event is the Atlantic uh, volcano, right? And that happened uh, in a period of uh, three months about it, from March to June of 2010. And, uh, and it disrupted millions of people's uh, travels and, and uh, uh, globally. So these are just a few key events happened that year, right? And uh, so this is all shows the, the nature, you know, anything happened to our society, to our actual, our, our, the, 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 our planet, and the, the, the impact is devastating. And, uh, and that's actually happened to be also the same year I took a kind of a, a time off from the work and uh, went to India to do our volunteer work. And uh, at the same year, I went to India and uh, I joined a nonprofit organization and, uh, and they tried to use my technical skills to help uh, a local nonprofit organization. And uh, the organization is called Dr. Randy's Foundation. And, uh, and, and on the left side, you see uh, that's kind of one of the uh, school district, you know, I wouldn't call it the school district, you know, kind of, you can think of one of the community learning center, right? And in front is a, a, a few teachers. And those are the uh, students who are eagerly trying to learn some of the very basic livelihood skills so they can find a job to make a living out of, um, so they can get out of their poverty, right? And the middle picture shows, okay, actually I'm working with the teachers, went to uh, even the local uh, communities, you know, and talking to their parents, right? And I try to recruit, okay, from their parents, hey, why don't you send your kids to this kind of a learning center so your kids can learn some uh, skills, right? And this is on the, uh, even towards the, the, the third picture, right? This is some of the uh, communities and uh, I visited, right? And uh, as you can see, how people live in, and even this is 2010, right? It's not like a far away. And look at some of the people living in what kind of conditions, right? They don't even have a, a, a good, a nice house as most of us have probably, right? And look at the living conditions. They cannot even have the good quality of waters. And not to mention, you know, the, the clothing, education, and, uh, and et cetera. So this is kind of the, the first few pages I showed you, this kind of natural disaster, right? And here is kind of even in modern days, in our societies, there's so many challenges and we have to face. And that kind of for myself, right? That's kind of internal crisis, you know, for my me, say, hey, what's going on in, in, in this, uh, our society, right? And why this is in particular kind of, uh, kind of impactful to myself, and uh, I just want to show you, bring you back, right? This are almost about the same time, right? And uh, I was like, really exactly the same time because of during that time, and IBM and some of our best AI researchers are developing a solution. And that was debuted, right, in the February, uh, February 16th, 2011. And that's IBM's AI machine called Watson. And that's the place I worked and uh, at IBM TJ Watson, right? And this IBM Watson is a, I would say really the probably uh, one of the first modern AI machine. And that is able to understand natural language Right, unstructured data, and able to solve very sophisticated questions. And in this particular competition, is the machine against two of the best world champions in a particular game called the Final Jeopardy. And it's okay, you know, if maybe some of people may not be familiar, this is kind of American uh, kind of a TV show uh, game. It's called a quiz game. And uh, the main message you need to know is this: this game is very, very. Uh, challenge, right? And uh, some of the questions, you know, even for myself, you know, being a PhD, some of the questions I cannot, cannot understand, uh, I cannot answer uh, properly. And But yet, this AI machine, it showed, right, is able to defeat two of the champions and won this competition. And that is a key moment in this latest uh, kind of period of AI. And that really wakes up people's imagination what AI can do. And this is kind of a key moment in our modern history. And of course, now, now people, I mean, especially uh, uh, this generation, right? The audience, most of the people here in this audience. And uh, when you heard of AI, probably you probably even 
not heard of this Watson. And what you heard, maybe it's this one, okay? And that is about five years later of that Watson machine. It's uh, this uh, Alpha Google, uh, Google's Alpha Go, right? It's an AI machine that is able to play the Go game. And also uh, on March 15th, and uh, there's a uh, Google's Alpha Go uh, defeated uh, a Go grandmaster, Lisa Do, right? This will show that AI can do wonderful things again. And of course, another uh, about seven or six years later, right? And uh, I would consider this probably is another key moment. And that's probably most of you started to realize about the AI and knows the power of AI. And that's the chat GPT and from the open AI, right? And that's in November 30th. And when they first released the chat GPT and uh, that has generated so many conversations around the AI and now almost everyone, right? And people who are outside of computing, uh, computer science and start to seem like they know about AI. And uh, this was uh, uh, even by Bill Gates and uh, said, this is really the, the dawn of the revolutionary, right? And uh, it's as important as uh, like a PC, like a comp personal computer and the internet and even mobile phones. So this is kind of a, such a big impact. And that's most people uh, start to get to know about AI. So now let me tie this back, right? The stories I said at the beginning. So I call all of this a very interesting kind of the demonstration AI, I call it flash AI. But what I think what we need is called earthly AI. And that's really when the rubber meets the road, right? And how do we take into account the societal and the economic considerations? So let me kind of to show you why I make that a point. And this is, again, I want to use some of the data points, right, which is kind of what I'm uh, intimately familiar with. I know this is a data point, again, back, bring you back to 2011 when IBM's uh, Watson, right? And uh, that AI machine and it defeated two of the best champions. And uh, look at the computers at that time. That's about 15 years kind of old already. Even in that time, right? And in order to develop the AI machines, you have to use this big, big machine, right? This is a supercomputer. And that is a 90 uh, IBM's okay, best uh, server machines at that time, it's power seven machines, and with the thousands of CPU cores, and with terabytes of memories, and 20 terabytes of disk, and consumes 100,000 uh, watt powers in order to uh, use that to kind of the computation, right? To, to uh, be able to compete in that uh, competition. And this is only the hardware. But if you look at the software behind it, this is only shows a very, very uh, kind of uh, high level view of the software pieces, right? And the high level messages, you know, the software to make that uh, game possible or wasn't possible to compete is a very complicated machine and a very complicated uh, the software. And this software has many, many different components, right? Because it has to understand a natural language and has to be able to reasoning and happens to able to uh, kind of knowing the betting strategy and has to also know the uh, where you are in the current uh, competition and where your competitors are. So you can make the right optimization to determine when you should uh, compete and uh, to answer the question and when you should not be. So this whole software system is very complicated and it takes uh, uh, more than uh, 30 IBMs to get top of one of the top, right? And the researchers and the talk took more than five or six years to develop such a software systems. So now you consider all of the cost to develop a, such a system is tremendous. And that the trend actually didn't stop. So this I'm showing you a little bit of a historical perspective in terms of developing a, a computing system, right? So you can see from the early days, by the way, this is the kind of a lock, uh, kind of uh, uh, the, the X axis, it shows us the uh, years, right? The Y axis shows the, the computation and it is uh, uh, the log scale, right? And you can see in the early days, you know, as the time progresses, even though we still, uh, the computation getting uh, more and more computation, but when this AI is starting to kick in and the, 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 the growth kind of really, really uh, kind of a, uh, picks off, right? And it uh, takes off. Now you can see this exponential growth and, uh, in the AI. So which means that the AI, in order for you to develop AI, 
you need more and more computation, and which means you need even more energies and the powers to uh, to make sure this is AI is possible. And uh, zoom in the kind of this period of the AI period, right? And uh, and uh, some of the uh, AI models, as you can see, and uh, look at the complexity in terms of the number of parameters. And again, this is a kind of the uh, log scale kind of a plot shows you right over time. And this is just also exponentially uh, increase. And which means that the models getting bigger and bigger. So which means in order for you to develop AI, you need even more bigger machines, even more power, right? And that's why I mean, if you look at the current, uh, some of the news, I just take a few snippets, right? And uh, people all crying, uh, kind of crying, hey, in order for you to develop AI, what will be the environmental impact, right? There will be a energy crisis and uh, we really need some more sustainable solution. And this is uh, this particular guy, right? This is the CEO of AI, uh, OpenAI. And this is kind of the, the main person behind us that tried the GPT. Look at some of his latest uh, comments, right? This is the beginning of the year. And uh, and he mentioned, you know, in order to develop AI and this energy, you know, is not sustainable. You've got to have a new solutions and to, to provide that kind of energy to sustain the AI. And uh, and also there's a big shortage of computing for AI. And now he's even trying to get the trillions, right, of dollars and to see, you know, can they develop even more uh, kind of uh, supply this uh, uh, computing chips to develop AI. So what is the message here? I bring you back to this picture, the contrast, right? And on the one hand, this is kind of the crisis I'm seeing in the in, in our modern days, you know, society, the challenges we are facing, and a lot of people do not even have a basic education, struggling the food, quality of the waters, right? Not to mention many, many other challenges, probably a lot of you don't even know about. On the other hand, we are developing the AI, and not only millions, right? Let's talk about the billions, the trillions of dollars, and some of the top best of AI researchers develop solutions. I call the flash AI. So how do we really bridge these two gaps, these two worlds? On the one hand, we have this earthly need that desperately requires the technology, requires innovation, requires the intelligent solutions to help them to scale the solutions, to solve the real societal needs. On the other hand, we have such a flash AI technology so how do we bridge the gap? So that's kind of the main kind of uh, drivers and has been driving my research kind of agenda. So how do we develop technologies that really solve the, uh, our human uh, societal need, not only for the flash side, right? And a bigger wow factor kind of uh, technology. And uh, so that's kind of led to a lot of years of my research and uh, and that's uh, a few years ago, you know, and uh, in 2019, and uh, in one of the TEDx talk, and uh, I gave this uh, talk, I kind of formula, kind of formalized some of my thinking, and I called it this a flesh and earthly size of AI. And for me, probably most of my research is on this earthly size of AI. And uh, feel free to check out some of uh, the, the, the YouTube channel, uh, this YouTube uh, video, if, you, if you're interested in, to know more about some of uh, my past research. So now let me just kind of uh, switch gear, right? To give you two examples, okay? And what I meant by the earthly AI research and why it is difficult, right? Why I need the talents and the people like you guys to, to join this uh, effort to put your best uh, talents into use and to, to develop more earthly AI solutions. And I'm going to give you two examples. And um, the first example and um, it's something probably you will be interested in because most of you, if you're going into the college, right, and going to the uh, uh, kind of a higher education very soon, you will realize and uh, you need to read a lot of the uh, research papers. And uh, this is kind of showing you some data about the number of publications, a number of papers published in various uh, uh, conferences. And of course, here I'm only mostly focused on the uh, AI conferences, right? And the Y-axis shows the number of uh, publications and the X-axis shows the number of years. 
And uh, from all of these pictures, the main message is, you know, as you can see, right, over time, and the number of publications has also skyrocketed, which means, okay, uh, there's a lot of people interested in to submit a, a research papers to conferences for publication, which is great, right? Because of that's how we disseminate knowledge and let the people know about your research. And so you can, people can learn from each other. But what are the challenges here? And uh, is this a review or process, right? Because for any papers, and in order to be published, you need to find as a qualified reviewers to review the papers, to make sure whatever you published meet a certain standards. So other people read the papers can learn something more genuine and more uh, kind of valid results. So that's when it's called the scientific uh, review process or the peer review process. And here I'm showing you behind the scene what is involved, right? And from the first one, when the, the moment that when, when the author submit the papers to a conference, there's many, many steps involved. And here just showing you this 11 steps, right? As uh, summarized by one of the conference called iClear. This is another uh, top AI conference. As you can see, there's many, many steps involved in order for the conference chairs to find the reviewers, a qualified reviewers to review the papers so they can determine which paper should be published. And among many, many of those process, two of the process is most time consuming, right? The, the third step, which is the program chairs need to determine which paper should be assigned to which reviewers. And yet you have to take into account all kinds of constraints in terms of the expertise, right? Because you need to find the reviewers has the right expertise to review the right paper and also try to avoid the conflict of interest and the reviewer workload, et cetera. So there's a lot of constraints. So the program chairs has to, to, to deal with. And the another step is this, okay, finally, right? And uh, uh, based on the, uh, the initial re uh, review assignment, right? Initial assignment. And the, the re reviewers also need to do uh, kind of the, uh, their own choices as well. You know, which paper you like it to review. So you need to take into account the reviewers' preferences. So all of this is kind of takes a tremendous amount of efforts from the program chairs. And that's kind of right now, if people pay attention, right? There's a lot of complaints about the quality of reviews as well. So this is kind of the very, very real earthly needs, right? And this is a very, very simple task. And yet you look at, okay, this is again like a blog I, I, I get from the ACL, which is another uh, top AI conference focused on the natural language processing. Right, this is uh, their uh, program chairs and uh, write this uh, uh, articles about uh, the challenges they are facing, and uh, they want to automate this process. You know, and it seems like uh, uh, this obvious, right? This is this takes so much time and uh, of the program chairs and reviewers time to find the right quality reviewers to review the papers. Why not use AI to automate it? But as you can see, the message I'm highlighting, right? Despite of this effort. At its end, they find out, unfortunately, right? Whatever the system they used cannot do the work. And at its end, they have to rely on manual effort, right? And to solve this very, very uh, fundamental earthly needs. So this is kind of a little bit of ironic, you know? This is ACL. This is the top natural language uh, kind of a conference, AI conference. Yet, right, this is a community not able to develop a solutions to solve this basic uh, uh, needs, which they need as well. So why is this so difficult to build a solution? And uh, so let me show you, right? Of course, one thing is of course it's the money, right? Because of, uh, there's no, uh, no, no, no bigger companies and uh, invest. And uh, from the technical side, you know, you may seem like, hey, this technology should be easy, right? And uh, indeed it looks like very easy, why? You can say, hey, let me take a lot of the papers, right? All the pub past publications. And uh, you can write some of the AI components. For example, you document the conversion, right? You convert the PDF into the text. 
and you run the natural language processing to extract the concept and uh, extract the reviewers, you know, and the, who has read the papers in the past, that it becomes the potential reviewers. And then look at every reviewers, you know, whatever paper you have published, then which kind of build your expertise, right? The expertise modeling of each reviewers, potential reviewers. And then you build the connections of those concepts, build the knowledge graph. So now if you can do so, right? If there's any new conference papers comes in and you can do similar, okay, hey, there's a new papers and what is the topic, right? And who has the right background expertise? So you can do the matching. And when you do the matching, you try to take into account the conflict of interest. You know, maybe there's a paper reviewers and the paper, uh, the authors, right? If coming from the same organization, or maybe they are related, they should not be the reviewers. They call a conflict of interest, right? And also take into account other workload, or maybe the diversity, fairness, and all of this one becomes a recommendation engine, right? You solve this uh, big optimization problems, you are done. Sounds very easy, right? There's all of these components. If you look at the papers, all the topics has been covered, but how do you put all the pieces together to build a solution that can really solve this challenge? And this is something like we try to uh, take a look, right? Because of every single of this so-called uh, component of the technology, if you look at the papers and everyone will claim they have solved this problem, they have made so much progress. But here, it's not about a particular paper. You want to make sure when you put the component into the end-to-end -end flow, it is able to solve the problem, right? And also, in order for you to have the solutions, it's not only one model, not only one algorithm. You need many, many algorithms, right? I'm, I'm going to, not going to through the different the details. Just let you, you can, as you can see from this very simple uh, review of this process, it requires many steps, right? Many different algorithms to work together. And uh, every single algorithms or every single steps, if you look at all the literatures, you will find that there's many, many solutions already, many publications. Which one are you going to pick for you to implement as a solution, right? And how do you know which one is better? And also, once you put all the components together, you also have to make sure this all system, the whole system can be run on a computing platform, right? The infrastructures, and you want to make sure that the system solutions can be solved in a reasonable amount of time, right? And so you don't have to wait forever in order to get the results. So now you can see, even for the simple solutions, there's so many challenges we have to answer. And yet, try to answer them is not easy. And uh, the long story short, right? That's kind of the things we have done. And uh, we try to build such a solutions. And, and we just showed you, this solution is not easy to do. And uh, after quite a few years effort, and some of my students, you know, together, we have built a prototype we call the reviewer scope. And we were able to work with a number of conferences, you know, as in the bottom, you know, a number of conferences, uh, uh, program chairs to help them to solve this problem. And uh, on the left hand side, it shows us, uh, some kind of a quote from Dr. Eric Altman. And, uh, and here's uh, um, uh, the program chairs of the ISCA 2019. Actually, he was actually the one which inspired us to help him to solve this problem. And uh, after we developed this pro uh, the prototype, and uh, and he is very happy to, and this AI solutions is able to help him to reduce the time, and also to kind of to our surprise, right? Because a lot of times we feel AI algorithm is kind of a, a black box, it's a kind of a lack of a transparency, right? And uh, so people may not like to use it. In fact, what he told us is, because of you use the AI much kind of automation because your process is consistent. And for him, he thought this actually can remove the bias, you know, and uh, it found the human review process and make the whole process even more transparent. And uh, that shows you once you are able to develop an um, early AI solution with the right technology, right? And uh, you can solve a real societal needs and uh, people can get a benefit. And uh, so this is a solution, you know, one example. So we developed, 
And um, so I will not claim the solution is fully 100% solved. And we are continuing to improve based on our understanding of the gap and of the um, kind of the, the, the still have the shortcomings, you know, have the challenges that we still have to face. And this still shows okay, a world AI is not as good as the, we like to have. And so some of my students are still working on this project and try to continue to improve it. So this is the first example. So let me switch to the second example. This is another project, which is kind of uh, one of my uh, biggest uh, project right now. And uh, I devote a lot of efforts to this one. And uh, so I call it this kind of my earthly AI journey continues, right? And uh, so this is, brings you back to like uh, what Melinda mentioned in the beginning, you know, that is the uh, National AI uh, Institute. And uh, how do we use the AI to help children with disabilities? And uh, this is a kind of, uh, we believe is a, to use the AI, right? To sort to address a real societal most pressing challenges. And, um, and this one was uh, uh, received $20 million from National Science Foundation and uh, last year. And uh, we are very happy to be able to uh, receive this grant and uh, to solve this uh, challenges, which I'm going to show you and the um, National Science Foundation and also the Institute of Education and the Sciences from the Department of Education are our uh, funding agencies. And uh, this National AI Institute, just for people who do not know, right, is one of the most prestigious uh, kind of uh, research grant in the US and, uh, and also it's very competitive. I know in the past uh, few years, only 25 uh, institutes get established, you know, which it shows on the uh, left hand side, right? Each institute will be have this logos and uh, they address a wider range of topics, you know, from agricultural environment, right? And education. And uh, we are the 19th in this, uh, the, uh, all of the 25 in terms of the time it was uh, the, uh, selected. And uh, we are the only one focused on the children with disabilities. And um, this is very important. And why? let me tell you why this is important, right? And uh, this kind of quick show you, okay, this, uh, we have a uh, total uh, nine universities and uh, joined this uh, AI Institute. And uh, we have uh, 30 faculty members. And uh, of course, with uh, even more students and uh, working together and, uh, to solve this problems and uh, collectively. And um, so now let me show you, you know, what is the problem we try to solve? And uh, what is the rationale behind it? and why we want to solve this one, and why this is a really earthly AI, okay? So this picture, right, this is kind of a num uh, graph, shows you in the US and uh, how many children in our current uh, public school system and how many children requires some kind of a special education services. In the US, in order for a child to be qualified to receive special education services, they have to receive some kind of uh, designation, right? or they, they have to be put into one of the 13 categories of disabilities, you know, as listed on the left-hand side. And from the specific learning disabilities, right? speech and language impairments, and autism and developmental delays, et cetera, et cetera, okay? And this is uh, the yellow bar that shows you the numbers, okay? And uh, and it shows you this uh, how many number of children and the fourth into one of these uh, certain categories, okay? And uh, and this uh, dark yellow shows the school age, which is the K to twelve, right? And uh, this uh, uh, lighter yellow shows the early childhood, right? And uh, shows the kind of the percentage wise. And uh, this is about six. Point eight million. The numbers that we took is from the uh, 2021, right? And uh, if you look at all the children across the spectrum here, of course, at children from different uh, with different disabilities, they will have a different need, right? For example, people with a developmental delay versus autism versus the hearing impairments, their kind of a special education needs will be different. But if you look at Look at uh, one of the common services across the board. We find actually one of the common services they all receive is this a speech 
and the language related services. So we did a very simple back of envelope calculations, right? Let us assume get, I have some numbers to back it up, right? So very simple calculations. Let's assume half of the students in the US uh, school public school system requires a speech language services. That's about 3.4 million children. Yet in the public school system, there's only less than 61,000 speech and language pathologists. Now you think about it. You have 3.4 million children in the school requires a special language, language, speech and language services. Yet in the school system, you have less than 61,000 speech and language pathologists to help them. Very simple math, do a division, right? Think of every child, how many times you can get from the speech language pathologist to help you to improve speech languages. I did a very simple computation, right? Just assuming all the teachers, speech language uh, pathologists, right? They do not uh, take any break every day, eight hours a day, right? Five days a week. Every child can receive less than eight minutes to receive the services. So that's why in the US school system, the SLPs is overloaded. They have too many intervention cases they have to deal with. They have too many children require their services. So they are understaffed, they are overworked, yet our children cannot receive enough or good enough or ability-based or customized services. That's one of the biggest challenge. And so let me show you how the current system works, right? So the current system works the following, you know, all the children, right? When they are young, no one knows, right? Do they have a disability or not? Because of in the US, we do not have enough the experts. So you cannot provide the universal screening. So what do you do? You rely on the parents or the teachers or relatives who at the hawk way to identify, oh, maybe this child may identify some issues. This is called identification, right? Then you may identify some of may potentially has disabilities. And then those parents may bring those children, go to the formal evaluation, right? And get the eligibility determination. And then finally, some of them will be qualified to receive the services from the public school system. And then each one will receive called the individualized educational plan, right? Called IEP. And the school will take this IEP for every child into account. And then the SLPs, right? Speech language pathologists or the special education teachers now need to provide the services for them. As I mentioned, because you do not have enough teachers and there's many more children require services, what do you do? You do the group-based intervention which means you take a group of children together working with one speech language pathologist because every child need is different. Obviously, you can see the, 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 the services every child received will not be optimal, will not be customized, will not be suitable for them, right? Because simply it's impossible, just the time. And, uh, and yet SLP is still overworked. That's what we see the challenges. And that's what we say, hey, that's where AI should help. Based on this identification, we first say, we need to do something. And of course, we didn't get all of this just simply because we just, hey, uh, out, of, uh, out of the blue, we think we want to solve this one, right? Actually, we have to talk to many people, the stakeholders, the parents, right? The teachers and the experts. And just show you, here are some of the um, experts that we talked to, right? And uh, so from there, not uh, kind of the comments to us, they said, okay, early screening, right, is very important because early screening can identify the children who has the need early so you can provide intervention early and then there's even higher chance for them to make up, right? Yet in the US, actually there's a lot of children actually do not even have basic access to pediatric care. So totally rely on parents or the teachers to identify, to do the screening is, is not uh, ideal. 
So that's kind of shows us, you know, what are the challenges, right? And also in the school systems, despite of the best effort of the special education teachers or the speech language pathologists, the intervention is very complicated, right? Because every child has its own individual educational plan, which means every child has a specific need. And how do you identify what is the best intervention you can you should have, right? What kind of a materials or the textbook or whatever the a material you can use to help this child to improve a particular uh, need. And also what the kind of exercise you need to do, right? In order for you to help that the child to learn uh, particular skills that is in the child okay, IEP. So that's what I mean, the SLPs spend a lot of efforts, right? To prepare the materials and yet cannot spend enough time to help with the children. So hopefully I can kind of illustrate that this is indeed the biggest challenges. And uh, that's why we propose, let's develop two AI solutions. The first AI solution we call it the AI screener. The AI screener is an AI technology that can provide universal screening for all the children. So we can identify the children who may be in need of the services early, right? So they can be identified, so they can be evaluated, being kind of assessed, so they can receive the eligible uh, uh, services sooner. So this is what we disseminate for the AI screener. I'm going to give a little bit more details later. Okay, this is an AI screener to enable the universal screen. The second solution we call the AI orchestrator. So the AI orchestrator is helping the uh, speech language pathologist, all the special education teachers to help it, uh, uh, to do the intervention. Because now you will be having uh, all the uh, children, right? Receiving different, with uh, different uh, educational plans. And uh, so we can help to the teachers to monitoring their progress and individual need. And so we can provide a dashboard for the teachers to see for every child, what are individual child's need and what kind of intervention they should use to help them to improve their individualized okay, uh, uh, needs better. So these are the two solutions we propose in our institute or we want to focus on to provide. Use AI to address these two earthly needs. And the high level is the use AI to scale the availability of a speech language pathologist and uh, to enable universal screening and also to provide individualized or customized ability-based interventions for every single child. So I'm not going to go into the details in terms of technology, just high level, right? So for the screening, we wanted this AI to be able to take the video streams, audio streams of the child, right? Especially children in the early childhood, in the, in the daycare kind of settings. And we are able to pick up children's natural interactions, you know, with each other or with the teachers in terms of the audio streams and the video streams, and go through a lot of this AI technologies. And finally, we are able to produce a very detailed report, right? And to show the parents, hey, does your child, right, may potentially have issues or not. And uh, only with the permission of the parents or the teachers and the parents can bring this child to the SLPs. And now we also help the SLPs, right? Because of the report, it's so detailed enough. Now the SLPs can quickly review the reports. They can do their assessment in a more targeted way. So they can be more um, effectively to do this uh, uh, eligible determination. They can do the assessment faster because of with the AI tools. And uh, this whole process will be validated you know, against the SLPs. So we want to make sure that whatever our solutions and has to be validated, you know, can do as good as the expert and also yet make them to be more effective. And, uh, and we will design the solutions and make sure that the solutions can be, uh, uh, will be accepted right, by all the stakeholders. So this is a lot of the AI technology need to be developed and a lot of AI technologies need to be integrated in order for this to 
uh, be possible. So that's kind of our center's uh, mission for the next uh, uh, five years. And uh, hopefully, you know, our solutions will be kind of some kind of the AI solutions, and we don't know what the embodiment will look like. Can be a robot, or can be just an environment, or can be an iPad solutions. We don't know yet, so we are still trying to figure this out. But our goal is, you know, these solutions can be put into the daycare, right? And observing the children's interactions and then provide an individualized report for every single child. So this is our vision for the AI screener. And for the AI orchestrator, you can think of AI orchestrator as a superset of the AI screener. It not only takes the video streams and its audio streams like the screening does, it also takes the children's because they are receiving the intervention now. So this is other for the kids, which is already in the school system. They have already been identified with their own individualized educational need. And now they're receiving the different interventions. So now we need to monitor in their intervention, right? Uh, kind of the, the progression. So that's what we call intervention streams. So all of this data need to go through the AI. Again, a lot of the AI components, right? And finally, this AI components need to be able to generate very detailed report, individualized report, and to the teachers. And also we were recommending for every child based on the need, what are the technologies, what are the interventions and the teacher can use. And also this intervention is evidence-based, you know, it's a scientific proven useful, right? So the teachers can uh, take the recommendations and help it better. And I, this, is, this is kind of the place I always try to make analogy, right? Think about as a YouTube right now, right? So, so or maybe think about it Netflix or whatever the, the the video platform, or maybe even the Spotify, right? So, how do you know which songs to watch, to to listen to, which movie to 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 watch, right? This in the back, there's some kind of recommendations. The same here, we want to have AI orchestrators to be the ones to recommending, not recommending songs or videos, but the recommending the interventions, right? The techn the techniques. So the teachers can use to help children. And based on these observations, we can also make the AI augmented new interventions to make some of the interventions even better. And of course, all of this, what I said, they did to be in order before this technology can be, um, can be deployed. So this is finally, our vision is this is solutions can become assistant to the speech and language pathologists or special education teachers in the school, uh, in the school settings. And uh, so they can help with the, uh, them to help the children better. So now, very quickly, right, to uh, we'll show you these are two uh, use cases and uh, two earthly needs. And uh, now let me spend a little bit of time to talk about some of the research challenges to give you a taste, right? How we're going to uh, develop the solutions and what we have accomplished so far. And um, and of course, our because we are focused on the solve provided solutions that is uh, uh, really can uh, meet the societal needs, right? And the earthly AI. So we not try to be fancy, and we try to take whatever is available, right? And uh, and uh, and uh, adopting the best practices. And this graph actually shows you know this is IBM when they developed the Watson technology, right? How they developed the Watson technology. So from very early on, right? They have to quantify their solutions, you know, and how good the solutions are. And as you can see, very early on, the solutions was not very good, but over time, the solutions getting better and better until you are able to uh, be as good as some of the best human champions. So this is how the IBM developed this Watson technology. We will develop, we will adopt the same, uh, same methodology to develop our solution, right? But uh, the technology will be different. And, um, so let me show you quickly one examples. So this is a one of the um, kind of the need, right, for the children with the speech language uh, needs. This is, let's assume that some of the children, right, they have the difficulty to pr pronounce the uh, sound. They call the speech sound disorder. And uh, the Abby here, and uh, she is a, a, a licensed speech language pathologist, and uh, she's on our team and uh, to solve this problem, right? And this is kind of, and uh, she told us, in order for her to help the children with the speech sound disorder, for example, right? She has to use a lot of the techniques 
one of the most important techniques is called a contrastive intervention approach. Meaning, if this child have a particular difficulties of a particular sound, you want to find a contrastive sound, right? So then you can give this child to practice, and, and also, which means you also need to find the word that can produce the sound. And then you find the flashcard that has the word. Then you can use this flashcard to play the game with the child. So the child can repeatedly say the same word, right? To pronounce the sound. So this way, how the children can re kind of improve their uh, ability to produce a certain sound. And uh, this is how they do it. And obviously you can see, right? If you, this is look at the, the bookshelf, how many flashcards they have, right? And uh, every child, the sound will be different. Now she need to spend a lot of time to identify what is the contrastive sound that is the most appropriate for this particular child. Once you identify the word, then you, she has to go through the shelf, look through all the flashcard to find the right flashcard has the right word so that she can use to practice with the child. That's, she spend a lot of the preparation time. Yet, she would like to take use that time to help children instead of spending so much time to the, do the preparation. So here, I'm showing you an example here, right? Like for example, if this child like have a difficulty to produce the sound of M, let's say M, right? And you want to find a contrast with sound of F, right? And why do you pick this two sound? Because of this, this two sound has different uh, uh, properties, right? And this, of course, this is all related to the speech language pathology. They are expert. So I'm just not sure. Okay, we just say, hey, let's just, that's when we need to work with domain experts, know the domain knowledge, right? So we know now the M sound and F sound is the right contrast. Now you need to find the word, like in this case, man and the fan. Why? Because the man and the fan, they have the only one sound, right? M, F, F sound is uh, different. The rest is the same. And yet M and F has uh, the place, they are the same, they both are a labial, right? And the voice, why is voice the sound? Why is the voiceless sound? Why is nasal? Why is the fricative? And now you need to find, okay, I need to find the man, the flesh card, the fan, the flesh card. Now I can use this one. And she has to do this for many, many different sound, right? With a, because every child is different. And uh, this here shows some of the examples. Wouldn't it be nice if our AI can do the following? Instead of asking as a speech language pathologist, right, to go through all the detailed steps as I mentioned, if the teacher can just type saying, hey, I have a child. This child has a difficulty to produce the sound of L. Can you please find a pair of words, right, that has a maximal contrasting sound, like the phoneme, that the differs at the initial location, at the beginning. Can you please find me the solutions? And that's interface we want to provide to the teacher. The rest will be the AI. The AI can take the teacher's need, go through a lot of the AI components, find the right pair of word, in this case, like a big or pick, right? And then also generate the flashcard and then produce a flashcard. So the teachers can type, get the flashcard, let the AI to take care of the rest. That would be nice, right? That would be wonderful. That's what we want to do. And that's what we did. And the solutions we showed you here, in fact, is produced by AI. And through the interface of the typing, as a teacher, just type what you need, we will produce the right word which is the right flashcard. That is the prototype we built already. And this already kind of amazed a lot of the SLPs. They said, wow, that's great. That can save them a lot of time. They want to use it. And that's the beauty of having this solution. And this not only showed what is AI is possible, this also showed actually what AI is not possible. Because of here, we can I can show you, right? And there's a peak or there's a leak. May I look at it here, right? This is AI generated pictures. To certain degrees, it is appropriate. But 
pedagogically, this is not the best. So how do you define the best pedagogically meaningful pictures for the world? And also sometimes the AI produces the word. We use the chat GPT, by the way, if you are curious, right? When we try to find the pair of word. In fact, sometimes the pair of word actually is not very accurate. So how do we improve it? So that's what I mean, based on this understanding, we try to develop a second solution or, or maybe say augmented solutions. On top of chat GPT, we develop another tool called phonics that can provide an even more explainable, you know, more direct contrast of a different sound, you know. And this you know, now as a teacher, you can show me what is the sound you need, the beginning, initial phoneme, like a ch, right? The middle, you have er sound, the final you have l sound. What would be the word that can satisfy all of these properties? We show you. This is a church, for example, right? That is the word you can use in order for you to have all the sound properties. Or maybe if you want to find some kind of the B sound or the P sound, have the contrast, but you want to have the length at a four, we can show you. Maybe you can say, hey, this is the uh, breeze or the price, right? So this is all kinds of the properties we can use. And if we can combine in the power of this explainable a uh, more transparent way of finding the right pair of words and back it to this uh, kind of the AI to generate the, uh, the flashcard. We can make our solution even better. Again, this is only one example. We have many, many such examples to show you. In order for us to realize this vision, well, we should spend our time to innovate. And well, the AI is still not good enough and still need a PhD or researchers or maybe all of you guys when you are interested in the research, help us to solve some of the challenges. So, so let me kind of conclude a little bit here. So this is what I, I, I want to convey to you, right? In order for you to develop AI solutions to meet the earthly need, you need to take a principled approach. And here are some of my recommendations, or at least some of the practice I like to uh, inform my students, right? The first one is to try to build on a functional AI solutions. Because once you build the solutions, you will realize what are the gap in the current AI, what is the bottleneck? And I can quantify the importance of that particular gap. So that way we can do the innovation in a more targeted way. And I can develop the models, the tools, and the systems more uh, targeted. And, and also students will be motivated because I, you know why you want to develop a certain models. Why do you want to improve certain tools? Because you can immediately see the benefit, right? Through this process, we can quantify the value of our innovation and we can continuously provide the solutions to address the earthly needs. And uh, so through the whole process, we can build a lot of solutions and uh, we can also develop some reusable AI components and that we can open source to the community and ultimately, and uh, we can make it as a disciplined approach, right? Becomes more and more mature, so more and more people can adopt it. And more and more people can help us to develop more solutions that our society, uh, our society critically need. With that, okay, thank you. And I'm ready for questions. Wow, thank you so much, Dr. Song, for that talk. Je uh, the work that you guys are doing is genuinely amazing. And it seems that if this work on developing an AI, an early screener and orchestration tool for speech and language problems in children is successful at scale, then it could potentially represent a monumental shift in how we approach early childhood development education, right? Because a tool like that would have the potential to revolutionize the field of speech language pathology by enabling earlier detection and intervention, right? Which is also crucial for improving long-term outcomes in communication, academic achievement and social integration. So that's amazing. Thank you, thank you. Well said, you said it much better than me, Melinda. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. You, you already said it yourself. I only summarized what you said, but um, I guess, yeah, so to kick off the Q&A, um, just we have 
the first question, just sort of going off of that segment, um, how, how does the AI ensure accuracy across children with maybe, let's say, diverse linguistic backgrounds or different dialects? Well, that's a very, very good question. Yes. And uh, so this is okay. Uh, this is also one of the issues, actually, we are also trying to uh, address as well. Right? Even I think some of people mentioned uh, Chinese languages, you know, actually, this is more than Chinese language, you know, even English, right? In the US, you know, there's all kinds of uh, uh, different uh, uh, dialects as well. And uh, that's what I mean, the screening, it has to be uh, culturally sensitive and uh, as well. And uh, so that's me, of course, unfortunately, okay, the current screening method actually is mostly based on the standard American languages, you know, and uh, unfortunately, right? And that's mean we will develop AI technology. First, try to make sure that our AI can do as good as the current uh, the uh, speech language pathologist is doing. So this is kind of to gain people's trust of what AI can do. But at the same time, in, on our team, we have the learning science people. We also have the uh, speech language uh, kind of uh, researchers too. So one of the concepts they call the, um, they want to develop some uh, screening metric that is uh, not a language dependent. You know, in other words, it's language agnostic. So one possible uh, metric they call the automaticity, right? So which means uh, in order to see uh, a particular child has issue or not, it doesn't have to know uh, how you speak a particular language, be the Chinese or English. The way you say it, you know, the how fluent you are, right? And how fast you are and uh, how, you know, kind of based on the uh, how many repetitions or the revisions you need. So based on those metrics, and you can identify which is the language agnostics. And this is one of the um, novel metrics we are uh, researching. And I'm sure there will be many others as well. And um, right. so taking the language agnostic is one approach, right? Another way is, of course, we can, we can develop a maybe language specific uh, screening, right? And that requires AI to be scalable, right? So that's why, what I meant in the last slides, which means the methodology need to be scalable, right? If I can do this one for English, Maybe quickly I can do for different English dialect, like a, like African American like a language English, right? Later on, if it's scalable, maybe for English, for for, for for German, for French, et cetera. So this requires AI methodology to be scalable. So we kind of take this two-pronged approach. Why is it developing language agnostic approach? Why is it to make it AI to be scalable? Hmm. Okay. Got it. Okay. Um, and I guess going off of that, um, oh, we actually have someone in the Zoom chat asking, um, as a Chinese language teacher, uh, how can we use AI in our teaching? Yes, and, and this is AI, of course, I mean, AI is a, <laughs> by itself, it's a, it's, a, it's a technology, right? It's a language kind of agnostic, and there's a lot of uh, actually very great uh, researchers in, in in China and also a lot of the Chinese okay, Americans, you know, they're also great uh, AI researchers. And uh, you just need to develop the uh, the, the AI you know, that can solve some of the uh, the, the problems, you know, in, in, in that context. You know, if you are a Chinese teacher, right? So you must know your domain way better than us, right? And you just need to work with the AI researchers, you know, to to formulate, right, uh, to in, kind of inform the AI researchers of what is your need, right? What are the solutions? How you envision? And same as us right here, right? We work with the domain experts to uncover, you know, what are the challenges and the co-envision, right? What are the solutions look like? Like as I mentioned, this okay, uh, the way we generate the flashcard, right? It's not a, like a AI researcher can can know. Actually, we have to work with domain experts like Abby, right? And she's a speech language pathologist. You know, in this case, you know, it will be you. You are a Chinese teacher here. So you would tell the AI researchers what are the challenges, right? And then what would you like to see the ideal solution look like? And then AI researcher can help you to deliver that solution. Thank you, that's fantastic. I think definitely AI in a sense really allows for the marriage of certain different fields, right? Maybe not even just in the context of education and for speech services and learning and even beyond that, right? With um, like, with medicine, with entertainment, so many different industries. There's a lot of possibilities that, and like you talked about in your talk, this especially 
these few years with the rise of chat GPT, there's just have been a lot of amazing things that are happening. Exactly right. Yes. I'm, I'm, I just give you an example, two examples of this as like earthly needs, right? And I'm right. sure many, many domains, right? If you talk to people, you will realize actually every aspect, oh, I would say every aspect of the societal fabric, right? There's some people, they request technology, they request AI to help. We just do not have enough people who knows about the AI or our AI is not scalable enough, right? Or low cost enough to help them. Definitely. And I, I think it's only a matter of time too. Things come with time and with time you can build these tools more and more to until it's eventually suitable for the solution that it's providing. Um, right, time, and, but we cannot keep waiting though. So we need people like you guys. Yeah, know. so there's also <laughs> urgency, right? There's definitely <laughs> urgency. Yes. And we have another person asking, um, I think you might know something about this. Um, so they're asking, are there any funding opportunities for AI tools built for educational purposes? Um, I don't know if this question is in the US context or not, right? Because I'm probably I, I can yeah. only US context here. And I don't know other countries, and I'm sure other countries are uh, definitely probably similar situations. In the US, yes. I mean, like, like as I mentioned, you know, even for our solutions, right? Like uh, we are uh, fortunately funded by uh, the Department Department of Education, like uh, the I, the IES Institute of Educational Serv uh, Educational Sciences. This is actually it's a, one of the institute under the Department of Education, and uh, they are our funding agencies, right? And uh, mm -hmm. and right now, if you look at it, uh, both from uh, NSF and I uh, and IES, there's a lot of uh, funding opportunities, and in fact, beyond this one, right, a lot of foundations. And uh, uh, they also have the funding opportunities. And uh, yes, there's a lot of opportunities. And education is a long standing issue, right, in the US. And just AI gives these people the hope, right? Hopefully, this AI can really solve this, uh, uh, this fundamental issues, you know, uh, once for all. Right. And uh, the person also confirmed it is the US that they were mentioning. So it's perfect. Yeah, I'm sure. I'm sure um, other countries will, will have a similar yeah. problems too. You know, because of this is just I, so. I, I would agree. It's it's very pressing as well. So I'm sure, uh, if from your experience, you it's like that in the U.S., then I would say other countries might be similar as well. Um. Okay. Oh, and we have someone else asking uh, a question more on learning AI. So they're wondering, is it possible to leverage, they said, thank you very much for the session. Is it possible to leverage robotics experience to learn AI? If it's possible, how how can they start? Oh, that's a great question. Yes. And uh, first, I want to clarify, right? Uh, the AI, because it's so powerful, please don't feel like, oh, I need to be working on AI to be so that I'm working on AI. AI actually is embedded in every aspect, right? Like a uh, and uh, the, if you are interested in the transportation, right, and uh, and the aerospace, and uh, and uh, I mean the, the life science, any aspect, you can somehow find a ways to use AI. And the robotics, that's another. Sometimes people may think of AI is equivalent to robot, right? Which even like our seem like our this uh, little logo here maybe have given up in impression. In fact, AI also is not equivalent to robot, right? Robots use AI technology, but the AI is not equal to a robot. So now let me be more specific to your questions about, you know, yes, how your solutions can, your, being, uh, yes, if you're interested in the robotics, they can help tremendous as well, because uh, like in our solution here, right? So we, we are envisioning, you know, what, what is our AI screener looks like, right? And uh, how our AI oxygen will look like, we don't know yet right now. One of the research we try to do, we call it user-centered AI design. So we work with the users to understand what will be the best embodiment that will look like. One of the embodiment, of course, will be a robot, you know? So think of the, if this robot, right, can be in the classroom, play with the child, right? And uh, solicitate certain response from the child. So we can better understand that this child language development, right? and do better assessment, then do better screening. So that will be one embodiment, right? The AI, robotic is a perfect match. There will be other embodiments too, you know, it could be just simply in the Apple apps too, 
which will be different story, you know. But yes, there's a lot of places, right? Like uh, there's a human robotic interactions and how do we use robotics to convey the technology and interact with people. And that's a great field to be. And there's many opportunities to, to develop your AI skills and also connect your AI skills, robotic skills, and to solve the particular problems. And I actually, on, on that topic, I actually believe I saw an article a while ago before your talk um, about using robots for speech therapy, uh, which was a part of something that your university did. Uh, I, I'm not sure if you, I believe you might know about that article. Yes, yes. Actually, uh, some of uh, one of our members actually is one of uh, and, and uh, uh, this kind of uh, you know research group. You know, the, the, the basic for them, some people use how to use the robots, right, to work with students. Yeah. You know, so to become a, like a like a like a like a you can think of either be a pet or be a, a companion. You know, so can provide some right. comfort. There's a lot of I mean, there's many many ways to use as a a robot. To, to work with children. And Definitely. Uh, yeah, so you have to come back to what are the use cases, right? And here I'm talking about more the use cases uh, uh, the, the, for the screening and for the AI orchestrator. There's many other use cases, you know, the robots, um, the, the, the robot can play a role. For sure, yeah. And I, I can also see just the very, the most obvious one would be robots. Of course, they're interesting to, students especially at a young age um since it might be something they haven't experienced before um right. especially since kids are so curious right um right. and uh, on the topic of uh sort of education definitely um especially with ai uh there's a lot of different opportunities if you find that ai is something that you're interested in there's many different industries that that could entail, right? You don't have to get fixated on just one aspect. There's AI in healthcare, there's AI in the entertainment industry. Um, there's so many different applications of AI that are out there. And even if you're, let's say you're less of the technical STEM person and maybe you're more interested in business, um, then there's still applications there as well. Um, AI on the business side, everything is possible. So, um, Thank you, Dr. Xiong, for also mentioning that as well. Um, we have one person asking, uh, they're curious more, um, they're curious about the AI work you guys are doing at the University of Buffalo. Um, and they were wondering if you could tell us more about that. Um, sure, actually, uh, Buffalo, this is a picture of a Buffalo, by the way. And this is uh, our camp, my, 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 my office is somewhere here. And this is the, the, the one of the lakes and the beautiful, uh, very beautiful place. And for people who like uh, Buffalo, right? It's uh, um, in the upper state of New York, uh, west of New York, the state of New York, and uh, close to Niagara Falls. And uh, and actually, Buffalo has a long history of uh, doing the AI research. And uh, and of course, this is and I didn't talk about it in the, in my slides, right? And for people who may not know, actually, AI is not something new. Okay, AI has been around for like say probably seventy years now. Right, it's the mid of fifties. That was AI was the first uh, uh, started in the U.S. and uh, just AI has been up and down for multiple times. And uh, this is the third time AI generated people's interest, right? And the imagination what AI can do. And uh, that's what I mean. During those before this time, right? And uh, and AI was not called AI because AI was uh, called AI winter. So a lot of researchers was not a uh, uh, even though they are doing work, is it is AI, but not called AI. And uh, one of the solutions actually was started at the, at, at the University of Buffalo. Is this like a, uh, uh, they call the pattern recognition. And uh, the, the use cases is to recognize the post uh, uh, address, right? So they work with the US post office to develop the, uh, the first system, deploy the systems to post the post officers to automate the mail delivery and kind of to recognize every mail, right? You write your address, you know, from whom to whom, right? In different people's uh, handwritings, you have to recognize it and sort it and uh, automate the whole process. And that was started at the UB. And um, so this is a kind of, uh, UB has a long history in the AI. And um, by the way, for lots of researchers in the, in the, 
if you have the people like from China, right, the audience, young audience, like the CEO of Baidu actually graduated from uh, Buffalo too. And uh, actually, oh, wow. yes. And actually my lab actually is, uh, is, is now he's is a, is a, is a, is a lab actually he donated and he and his wife donated to Buffalo, you know, in, in our department's 50 years anniversary, you know, he, 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 he made a small donation and, uh, and that's my lab where, it's, where it is now. And anyway, so, so wow. Ruby has a long history in the AI and the right now, and uh, it's especially given this like, a recent uh, National AI Institute, right? And now we are very much focused on the AI for education and the UB is a lot of, put a lot of effort and also the AI for healthcare, right? And also very recently, and uh, people, if you, if you have, you, I don't know if you paid attention to, right? New York State Governor and uh, Hoko and uh, made announcement, right? They invite, they call the Empire AI uh, program. And uh, that is what is the first of a kind in the US, right? And uh, the New York State govern, government are going to invest $400 million to build the best public right, AI infrastructures. So it's instead of like only the AI infrastructure in bigger companies like Google or Facebook or Amazon, right? And uh, Microsoft. Now this AI infrastructure will be available in the public settings, you know, enable the public universities in New York, right? And the small business to access the best AI infrastructures for innovations. So, so that everyone can get a benefit of this AI development. And there's a whole empire AI, $400 million investment, right? To build the latest AI infrastructure will be hosted at Buffalo. So we will be the host of this 400 million, uh, this empire AI infrastructure. So there's a lot of exciting things that are going on at UB. And uh, if anyone is interested in, and uh, please you know, uh, consider UB, right? For your future studies. <laughs> The place you want to do work for us, right? Or oh, just come to visit us, you know? And uh, yeah, definitely. Place. And maybe you'll see Dr. Shong there. Who knows? <laughs> yes, be happy to host you guys. Just you have to mention, yeah. you know, you are coming from youth AI. For sure. Yeah, I mentioned that you're at Dr. Shong's talk at Youth AI Lab. Um, and uh, unfortunately, we are quite over time thank you so much dr Xiong. really apologize for taking up time but um i hope you don't mind if we just ask like maybe two two or three more questions is that all right with you oh, definitely definitely yes yes please yes okay fantastic um we have just one question uh back going back to sort of what you're doing with the ai screening um I, I was actually curious, um, will this technology be accessible to all socioeconomic groups? And how do we ensure that disadvantaged communities also benefit from advanced AI screening tools? Oh, that's a great question. Yes, this uh, accessibility and, and the social benefit is something which is uh, uh, from very early on, it's kind of, we take a, uh, we, we, we have already considered that a solution. And that's why I mean, our um, solutions, right? We mentioned, you know, for example, like an AI screener, we said that like, we will, uh, let me just go to this one. Yeah. We said that we will focus on our AI screening, uh, the screener solutions, focus on the early childhood classroom, right? So we are, let's assume that okay, this AI screener become a solution. We assume this, we imagine this solution will be available for all the daycare centers, right? And the people can either rent or can buy and all can be some of the community centers. They can have the solutions, right? So long the parents agree, you know, they, because the, this is kind of in the public settings and uh, some of this uh, interaction data is uh, probably less uh, of a concern of a privacy. So this way they can use this AI screener, right? To be, to get some of this uh, analysis and produce a report that only parents can, uh, can see. And uh, so that's when, you know, so the, in terms of the cost, Right, in terms of accessibility, this will not be a, a major issue, you know? And also right. once technology becomes more mature, right? And again, the people trust. And we also imagine this solution can be uh, like uh, purchased by the communities or the libraries, right? Like in the US and anyone can just go to the libraries and maybe check out the solution, take a home, you know, do some kind of a screening and uh, and uh, you can keep it for, for a day or a week or something, right? So yes, this uh, accessibility is definitely something we, we we have uh, considered as well. Wow, you guys were definitely very thorough. <laughs> Thank you.
Um, and I guess just one more question on the research side. I was wondering, like, is there any further research that you think is needed to enhance the effectiveness and reliability of AI in the early screening of speech and language disorders? Oh, there's a, a lot of a lot of research questions, right? And actually, like, just just give a simple example, right? Like this audio, and uh, because the people remember a lot of people are now using the iPhones, right, or using the uh, like uh, the this voice and speech, right? Be the Alexa or or be the Siri, and you may think of this uh, speech recognition is very uh, uh, advanced, right? And uh, it's very much uh, solved the problem, and in fact, this is not the case, you know, because if you talk about the automatic speech recognition for children's languages, and the error rate drops tremendously, right? And the learner is less than twenty percent, and in order for it to be usable. There's a lot of technology need to be developed. There's a lot of research work need to be done. And that is why uh, this is still a research project instead of just only a developmental project. Mm -hmm. Definitely, yeah. I think a lot of projects such as these initiatives need to be backed by a lot of data. So it definitely makes a lot of sense. Um, and we have someone else asking, uh, I, I think this is actually a good question since um, we are a youth organization dedicated towards increasing AI opportunities for youth. So someone is asking, do you offer research opportunities or internships to high school students? Oh, yes, we do. We do, definitely. Yes, we, we love to have some students, you know, and from high schools. And we have some experience of mentoring the high school students, you know, not in this, uh, in our institute, uh, in this in this current institute, because Rana is very young. In my prior um, uh, organization and uh, in the and in, your, in your intro, right? I mentioned like I was uh, the co-director with the uh, IBM Illinois Center, and uh, yeah. we mentored you know, for the high school students, and uh, and uh, we even published papers and uh, with her, and uh, she actually got uh, the best paper uh, award for the work, and uh, she was wow. also yeah admitted to the uh, uh, Caltech, you know, the best you know, one of the best top universities. Yes, yeah, so we do, and certainly I always keep this in mind, right? Like uh, anyone. Uh, interesting in the research right if you have the dedication you have the passion right and you have the drive to learn and uh, yes we are open and um, feel free to reach out and uh, we can talk about it as well where do you think they can where do you suggest they reach out if they're interested in these opportunities and uh, yes for them they can send their emails you know and uh, and uh, this is a special offer Right, and uh, people <laughs> in this audience, they can send their emails to me directly, and um, okay. at my at, yeah, at my Buffalo's uh, just my first name, uh, Jinjin at buffalo.edu, and um, yeah, feel free to 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 send me you know with your with your resumes and with your your interest and your time commitment, right? And of course, make sure that you you still have your time to finish your high school, you know, and, uh, of course. Yeah. and also your college well, application, everything, you know, and uh, well, yeah. That's, yeah. Well. That's, that's an amazing opportunity. Do you do you mind uh actually do you want to drop your email in the chat then just so they can note oh, yes, it down? Yeah. Sure, sure, please. I, I, I let yeah, I can do it. Oh yeah, please let's go ahead. My first name at the buffalo.edu. Yeah, sounds good. I'll put it in the chat. Um is your last name also the name or just your first name? That's my first name. Does that look correct? The email that I paste in the chat? Yeah, that's correct. Okay. Um Sounds good. For anyone who might be interested in the special offer that uh, Dr. Song is offering, um, feel free to reach out at his email with any credentials that you would like to provide. Yeah, um, please mention the promotion code, Youth AI. <laughs> the promotion code. <laughs> yes, definitely. Um, looking forward to if one of our Youth AI members becomes an intern. <laughs> um, but yeah. Definitely on the note of high school is just to for a closing question, one that we ask, usually ask all of our speakers. Um, mm -hmm. I just yeah, uh, what would you say um to if you have, sorry, um, since we're approaching the close of this talk, um, definitely just uh, of course, thank you uh for sharing your expertise and vision with us today, um. Definitely your pioneering work in leveraging AI to screen and facilitate early intervention for 
children with speech language problems isn't just innovative and and significant it's truly inspiring right um like you said earlier flashy ai versus earthly ai something that is genuinely working to help um the younger generations and definitely the success of these ai driven initiatives would could definitely lead to a society where fewer children fall through the cracks right where every child has the opportunity to reach their full communicative potential and the barriers to learning and interaction imposed by um, these speech language SP, S, SLP issues are significantly reduced. So definitely that's amazing what you are working to do. So um, from your perspective as someone in the field with a lot of experience, obviously, um, and as someone who has done a lot of work towards furthering our society by using AI, um, I just wanted to ask, what advice would you give to high school students who are interested in AI, looking forward to get started, but don't necessarily know where to start? What advice would you give these high schoolers? Sure, sure. Thank you. Thank you, Marinda. You, um, thank you first for your, for your, for your very, very uh, generous okay, word from about me. And uh, in terms of the uh, kind of a few words for, for the high school right, uh, or, or anyone actually uh, interested in the AI, and of course, AI is right now very hot, right? And uh, and everyone wants to 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 redo the research of AI. But I want to let you know, okay, you know, actually in uh, in the early uh, like a like a phase of your career, right? And uh, still, all the AI is grounded to some very fundamental um, skills, right? And uh, that is some of the like a basic analytic skills, right? Which means you need to still be good with your math. And uh, still, we need to go a bit with this, this uh, kind of the reasoning, right? Logical thinking. So some of those kind of training is still important. So don't, for the sake of learning AI and to learn AI, and still have very solid foundations. So please pay attention to your foundations, right? And the second, the AI is not because of you working on AI. You say I'm working on AI. As as, as Melinda you mentioned, right? There's so many right. places AI can be leveraged. So and AI is more than computer vision. AI is more than a natural language processing, right? And uh, AI is more than the robotics as well. There's a lot of places, right? And uh, that you can uh, you can help. So for example, I know okay, in, in our community, right? In the AI community, actually we, we are struggling actually to find the people who are interested into knowing the computer architecture, right? And uh, the systems, because you say, hey, that is hard work. You know, there's nothing to do with AI. Actually, that's not the correct. And AI actually is all about the hardware, in a, in, I would say, right? Because finally, no matter what the solution you are building on, you have to run on the piece of hardware. But the, if right. the model gets bigger, you know, and as I mentioned earlier, right, like the energy consumptions, the power consumptions, and the cost, the performance, speed, throughput, right? You need the people know those fundamentals. So that's what I mean. If you are in any areas, right, knowing better of even the, lower level stuff, right? Be the firmware, computer architecture, operating systems, programming languages, right? All of those actually is very, very fundamental, important for developing better AI, okay? And not to mention any other domains, you know, if you are not happy to be not in computer science, totally okay, you know? Even like a speech language pathologist, you know, they are our, not, not my best friend, you know, to work with AI together. So yeah, I would say any field, you know, just do well, and of course, knowing AI know, knows how to talk to your AI friends, you know, so let the AI friends to work with you together. Definitely, that's fantastic advice, I would say. And also, if you're just getting started in AI, um, looking to get more background info, of course, like Dr. Xiong said, getting foundations is very important and there's so many diverse applications. And um, if you really are interested in AI you're, and you're here listening to Dr. Xiong's talk, I would say you've already taken the first step so congratulations. <laughs> and on behalf of everyone here, thank you again, Professor Xiong, for dedicating your time and efforts to today's talk, as well as, of course, such an amazing cause. Um, we're all excited to witness the progress of your work and um, the implications for bettering our society. And I hope that some of our high school student members can also maybe contribute in this endeavor. So all the best wishes to you and your team. and all the great work that you guys are doing. Um, thank you so much for your time again. Uh, I, I, I'm aware we're a lot 
um, far over the original time, but really appreciate this. Hey, no problem. Okay, uh, thank you so much, uh, Melinda, for giving me this opportunity, and uh, thank you everyone for staying late and uh, and uh, to listen to <laughs> some of my <laughs> kind of uh, sharing some of my experience, and uh, hopefully this is uh, something useful for you. And uh, thank you for sure. Yeah. And I, I learned a lot myself too. So really appreciate you taking the time out of the day to come speak to our audience. Thank you. Sure, great, great. Okay, take care. Bye-bye. Take care. Have a good one. Thank you so much, everyone, for coming today. Thanks. Bye, everyone. Bye, everyone. Have a good rest of your evening. And if you guys want to stay up to date with future talks, um, of course, we have an upcoming one on March 23rd. And Feel free to also register on our Eventbrite or on our uh, website for more information. Thank you, everyone, for coming today. Thank you, Melinda. Bye. Thank you, Dr. Xiong.